Thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Villegas. It is very nice to see a lot of familiar faces here today. Um, I'm so happy to be with you. So uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about some of the current work studying the recovering brain as well as, oops, hold on a minute, there we go, <laughs> as well as investigating the safety and feasibility of the remote delivery of non-invasive brain stimulation in the home setting. So our agenda for today, um, I'll introduce you a little bit to the Pediatric Neuromodulation Laboratory here at the Weissman Center. I'll talk to you about uh, two of the major studies that we have going on right now, which are the baby brain recovery study and then remotely monitored transcranial direct current stimulation, future research directions for the laboratory, and then of course time for questions. So the Pediatric Neuromodulation Laboratory is led by Dr. Bernadette Gillick, a physical therapist and a neuroscientist. We are a team of scientists, physicians, physical therapists, and students based in the Weissman Center, working both locally and internationally to study neurodevelopment and rehabilitation in the context of early life brain injuries and cerebral palsy. We work with families and children who either have a diagnosis of CP or a predisposing brain injury. And we work with kids of all ages, really from birth through early adulthood. And we do this with the overall aim of empowering children for life. What exactly empowerment means changes from case to case, whether it's helping families to understand the specific needs of their child, investigating the efficacy of new interventions, or helping a child to understand what makes their brain unique, it's all part of the broader mission. That's the pediatric part of the Pediatric Neuromodulation Lab. Now, what do I mean by the word neuromodulation? The term encompasses tools for non-invasive brain stimulation. These are methods such as transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, and transcranial direct current stimulation, TDCS, that have the ability to alter brain activity, either transiently for assessment purposes or over longer time scales for interventions. Our lab uses both assessment and intervention methods of neuromodulation. Our lab works primarily with children with CP or infants who have a high probability of developing CP. A primary cause of CP is perinatal or early brain injury. That is an injury occurring to the brain at or around the time of birth. This includes a broad range of injury mechanisms from perinatal stroke, a brain bleed, intraventricular hemorrhage, uh, periventricular leukomalacia, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, and others. This image here shows 30 participants with CP from a past pediatric study in our lab and really highlights the variability in different types and locations of brain injuries that can occur. Each triplet of images that you see here are different views from the brain from MRI scans. Here, the injuries are primary, primarily visible as dark fluid filled spaces or what we sometimes call lesions. As you can see, there's a huge amount of diversity in the scope of brain injuries these kids had. In some cases, they were highly local lesions, uh, where in others, they essentially take up almost an entire hemisphere where the brain tissue has been replaced with cerebral spinal fluid. Our current work is focused on two main domains of improving pediatric care for people with CP. The first is early detection. Historically, most infants with CP were not diagnosed around two years of age because motor symptoms don't always clearly present right away. In the past several years, however, there's been huge improvements in our ability to accurately detect CP at earlier ages. Now, with a combination of movement assessments and neuroimaging, diagnosis of CP is often able to be made with a high likelihood within six months of age. However, Elements of prognosis, including severity and subtype, are often still unable to be determined until much later, though elements may strongly intervent, which these elements may strongly influence intervention decisions. So we can continue to improve on early detection and can move beyond just diagnosis to also predict prognosis. The second area is therapeutic intervention. Developmental neuroscience tells us that early infancy is a period of heightened neuroplasticity. With, when considering interventions to support recovery after brain injury, this period of increased plasticity may offer us greater responses to treatment. 
However, there are still many unknowns surrounding timing of subsequent recovery, neurophysiologic development after injury, as well as optimal timing, dosage, and method for early interventions. So in order to address these issues of early diagnosis and improved prognosis and to lay the groundwork for assessment of early interventions, we started the baby brain recovery study with the goals of developing strategies for earlier diagnosis and intervention during this heightened period of neuroplasticity that may impact lifelong outcomes. And to understand how the motor system develops after brain injury, particularly in the case of the neural tracts that control voluntary movement, which may contribute to earlier diagnosis and prognosis. This study aims to answer the important question, what are the associations between early brain injury, organization of these motor neuron pathways, and early motor outcomes with CP? This is a longitudinal study ranging from birth to two years of age. The first full study time point typically occurs between three to six months corrected age. However, we are able to enroll participants prior to their first birthday. Each time point consists of two study sessions over the course of two days. At the first session, we collect a nighttime MRI. Then the next morning, we perform motor assessments and evaluate brain and muscle connectivity using single pulse TMS. We have participants come back about every six months for another round of these same assessments so that we can see how these uh, things that we're assessing are changing over time. In essence, the goal of this study is to take a comprehensive assessment at each time point of a child's neuromotor development by looking at their motor function, their brain structure, their motor neuron pathways, and their motor responsivity to brain stimulation and how these quantities relate to one another. We then look out to how this snapshot and how these relationships change and evolve over time as the child uh, develops and recovers from this early life brain injury. So far, we have 22 participants enrolled with 55 completed study visits and zero adverse events. We're just starting to have our first two-year sessions with our earliest participants, which is really exciting. Enrollment is planned to continue until August of 2025, with the study finishing two years later in August of 2027. The next study that I'll talk about illustrates the ways in which we're trying to make our research accessible to more people, specifically by sending the study to the participants rather than having the participants come to the study. As you're all aware, traditional CP therapies often require costly clinic-based sessions and sometimes offer limited functional gains. There's a pressing need for innovative, accessible, and cost-effective rehab strategies. Transcranial direct current stimulation, TDCS, is a form of non-invasive brain stimulation that has shown promise in enhancing motor function without serious adverse effects, especially when combined with traditional rehabilitation. While at-home tele-rehab has improved access and compliance, pediatric studies specifically on remote neuromodulation are lacking. So building on previous remote TDCS studies in kids with CP, we're now presenting our investigation into the safety, tolerability, and feasibility of active remote TDCS. This study is motivated by our current knowledge of healthcare disparities between urban and rural living people. In the US, children living in rural areas are more likely to have a CP diagnosis, but utilize less support services. TDCS is currently being evaluated for efficacy as adjunctive treatment with physical therapy for kids with CP. But if this is something that's only happening in urban settings with major research institutes, people living in rural areas won't be able to benefit from it. So we can bring the technology to the participant rather than the other way around. We conducted this pilot study with 10 participants, ages ranging from 10 to 19 years old, across the United States, where we would pack up the study equipment, mail it to the participant's home, 
then schedule a series of Zoom calls where the study team member here in Madison would walk the family through the setup of the device and conduct the experiment remotely. For the purposes of the pilot, we also had a team member travel to the participant's home to ensure that everything was done safely. However, they didn't provide any instruction. The instruction was all remote. What we found is that remote TDCS is safe and feasible. All 10 participants completed study sessions without any serious adverse events. All minor adverse events, things like tingling or itchiness reported by participants were similar to what we'd see in the lab setting and were all self-limiting. When measuring comfort, 84% of the participants reported stimulation to be comfortable and 16% reported slight discomfort, but still tolerable. This study reduces participation barriers by eliminating travel time and expenses, benefiting families involved in multi-day interventions or those in rural areas lacking nearby healthcare facilities. At-home TDCS also promotes equitable access to interventions, improving study diversity and inclusivity for historically underrepresented groups. Additionally, remote TDCS eliminates, um, oops, <laughs> same information here. Uh, all right, so this is basically what I just said. Okay, so our goal is that this work will start a fruitful line of research into the best ways to improve rehab efforts and care for people with CP. The importance of this research is not only to enhance motor function in kids with CP, but also revolutionize access to healthcare for kids with CP. By investigating remotely instructed TDCS, we aim to break down geographical and financial barriers, ensuring equitable access to this innovative intervention for both urban and rural families. This study could lead to a reduction in the overall cost of rehab. So through this research, we strive to not only advance quality of care, but to foster inclusivity in healthcare and transform the lives of kids affected by CP. As of today, uh, the next steps in this study are that this is being conducted in rural areas of Australia, and three out of 10 particip participants have successfully completed the study. Another study that our lab is doing is um, part of a multi-site national trial of two different doses of constraint-induced movement therapy as compared to a usual and customary treatment. And lastly, one more current study is looking at um, enhancing infant brain imaging techniques and developing a quantitative atlas of early brain development to help refine MRI for kids and young children so it can be quieter and faster so we're more successful. Uh, build an atlas of what typical brain development looks like at these age and use new techniques for early CP diagnosis in at-risk kids. So let's talk a little bit about future directions that our lab is going. Our lab is committed to expanding diversity and access to research by actively addressing barriers. We've secured a diversity, equity, and inclusion grant to support these initiatives. We've created, created a PNL travel passport, which is a document that we give to parents in the baby brain recovery study that assists with parent understanding of all aspects of the study process. We've translated all recruitment and study materials into Spanish, and we've partnered with local community organization and groups like La Movida Radio and the Foundation for Black Women's Wellness. These efforts aim to ensure inclusivity and increased representation within our research. We're currently exploring the use of TMS motor mapping as a tool to support pediatric surgical planning. By identifying critical motor and functional areas of the brain, TMS can help guide surgeons to avoid damage to essential brain regions during procedures, especially in children with conditions like epilepsy or brain tumors. This approach enhances the precision and safety of surgical interventions by providing detailed functional maps of the brain. We're also leveraging machine learning to push the boundaries of pediatric precision medicine. By using advanced algorithms, we're working to classify MRI tissue characteristics in infant with brain injuries, as well as identifying biomarkers from EMG or electromyography data to better understand motor circuitry development. 
These approaches aim to enhance early diagnosis and create more individualized treatment strategies for young patients. I'd like to uh, briefly acknowledge all of our many generous funding sources. And that is all I have for you today. And I would welcome any questions that you might have about our research. me get an idea of like what is happening with the transcranial direct current stimulation yes exactly so um so here's a little friend so what this device is doing um is stimulating parts of the brain that we know to be involved in motor movement so the idea behind this kind of experiment and technology is that alongside rehabilitation, which is also stimulating some of these areas of the brain, we can increase neural activity in these parts of the brain um, as sort of an add-on to improve motor results. Um, so uh, these sessions were as sort of like the pilot program. Um, these sessions, I think, here we go, um, are 20-minute sessions. Uh, Again, they're delivered remotely, um, uh, set up in practices done without the stimulation. Uh, but that's sort of the basic idea behind that is sort of how can we give an additional boost to the neural activity to improve and promote that plasticity in some of those injured regions. <laughs> yeah. Um, my question is if TDCS like eventually was accessible and things like that, is there any estimation of what like an out of pocket cost would be for a family without insurance? That is a fantastic question that I I don't have the first clue as as to what the answer would be. Um but, uh, you know, obviously this, this technique is still being developed and researched, um, but I certainly think that there would be benefits that um, you could, you know, provide an argument to the insurance company. Um, and I, I certainly assume that these researchers would sort of be part of some of these policy decisions and advocating for how the insurance company would probably save money in the end with doing more effective therapy, which could mean less therapy potentially overall, as well as um, if we can deliver some of these things remotely, um, you know, it's just, it's more equitable, more inclusion um, for, for people who may not have access to some, um, some of these like centers that are doing this kind of groundbreaking research. If a family is interested in learning more about if they would be a candidate for participating in any of your research projects, how would they go about learning or learning more? Yeah, wonderful question. Um, so on this last slide here, oh, no, nope, that's it. There we go. Uh, so this is a QR code that should take us, that should take you to our website. It's also on the bottom there. Um, so that homepage will get you all of the information about the studies that we're currently recruiting for. Right now, uh, we have finished our TDCS trial um, in the US. And so experiments are going on in Australia with our research partners. Um, we are still currently recruiting for the baby brain recovery study. And so um, if you know of or work with um, with children who have had an early brain injury, we would love to talk to you about the benefits of um, participating in our study. Uh, it's not an intervention study, it's, it's observational, but it's a really wonderful opportunity for families to learn so much more about their child's brain and motor development than they would typically have access to in a clinical care setting. I think you guys are doing an excellent job, like trying to make uh, the study more diverse and inclusive and what you're doing with the community to encourage that. But I was wondering what the demographics of your study samples actually look like. And I guess like the success rates of 
those efforts because of the inherent, you know, like trust with marginalized communities and our institutions? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, So for the rural TDCS study, I believe I have it on here. Um, So we use something called the Rural Urban Commuting Area Codes, which was kind of basically looking at like how far do people have to go from their house to get to like work and appointments and things like that. So three of the 10 participants were considered rural in this specific study. Um, I don't have the the specific numbers on me, but I mean, you absolutely hit the nail on the head that, you know, we tend to get um, families that have access to more resources participating in our studies because they might have more of the flexibility to take time off of work or to travel. Um, I will say that for the baby brain recovery study, we do pay for all travel expenses. Families are also paid. um, uh, They're paid for each study visit that they participate in. Um, But it's it's still a challenge to be able to recruit more of these underserved populations. Um, I think sometimes just from a feasibility standpoint. So it's something that we are working on, but it it's hard. It it is it is tricky. There's a lot of um, a lot of like pieces of the puzzle to sort of put together. Yeah. Um, related to both of those past questions, how did you guys recruit for the TDCS study, and how are you recruiting for the baby brain ones? Like, what's your main way that you're getting participants? Yeah. So, um, so we have partners here at UW, at Meritor, at some other, um, like major hospitals sort of throughout the Midwest where, um, we are in touch with nurses and staff who work on those units. So, um, children that are admitted to the hospital that would be eligible for our study, um, we're, we're kind of kept alert of those, those children and when they might be discharging. And then, um, we found from talking to families that sometimes being approached about the study from a care provider that they're familiar with is more successful than, um, someone from our lab kind of just showing up out of the blue (laughs) in their room. And so we've started to partner with, um, some of the physical therapists at American Family so that they can introduce the study to kids that would be potentially eligible while they're working with them. Um, we're also, we've got ads for like across, you know, conferences, we've taken out ads. There's been like some nationwide parent groups on social media that we've advertised with. Um, so kind of any any way we can get the word out, we, um, you know, we're doing like local and community events, um, but it's sometimes a tricky population to recruit just because there's so much going on at that time, you know, when, if your child's still in the hospital and this sort of traumatic thing has happened to them. Um, so, um, so yeah, it's, it's a lot to, to ask of these families at a, at a time that's really stressful, um, but that's what's been really helpful about partnering with all of these local providers um, because the families that have participated have per- given us really positive feedback about um, really how much they've gotten to learn about their child, both from our assessments, but from also just talking to our study team members at visits. Um, as far as the TDCS trial, I believe that there was a large portion of children that were part of um, some kind of like CP soccer group. <laughs> um, I wasn't directly involved. I was in the lab, but I wasn't directly involved with that study. Um, but I think because the kids were older and because, you know, we could bring everything to them, recruitment was um, a little bit easier. And I think we had a lot more interest than we could obviously accommodate with only 10 participants for the pilot study. Um, but I think Social media, I also think we've had parents that have kind of become sort of ambassadors for us and they're in parent groups and are spreading the word about their positive experiences. So lots of lots of different avenues. But if you have any other ideas, please let us know. <laughs> we yeah, we'd be happy to to talk to anyone who might be interested or anyone who might work with um, with children in this population. Yeah. qualify and to be in the study do you recommend like we reach out to you do we direct uh, family to that website or how do you recommend yeah that's a great question um 
So I, I think either way could be feasible. Um, we do have some extra materials that we can provide that we can give to care providers if um you know that that would be something like to have on hand that you know you can have a little there's like a little bit of a script in there which you don't have to follow word for word um but it would give you you know kind of baseline information to tell people about you can certainly if you feel like the family is really proactive you know direct them to the website um but e either way um either way that you think would be more successful like i said we can get you materials to give to families um but they can also just contact us directly too. And we're happy to talk them through, answer any questions they might have. Um, and also our study is kind of three armed with the MRI and the TMS and movement assessments, but um, you know, parents get to make the call. They don't have to participate in all aspects of the study to be a part of the study. And so there's really a lot of flexibility depending on the comfort of the parents with, um, with certain types of tools that we're using. Right. Thank you so much for your attention. Please um, do not hesitate to reach out if you have any additional questions.